Chapter 10, Part 2 of Kangaroo by D. H. Lawrence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10, Diggers, Part 2. After breakfast, Summers got Jack to talk about Kangaroo and his plans. He heard again all about the diggers' clubs. Nearly all soldiers and sailors who had been in the war, but not restricted to these. They had started like any other social club. Games, athletics, lectures, readings, discussions, debates. No gambling, no drink, no class or party distinction. The clubs were still chiefly athletics, but not sporting. They went in for boxing, wrestling, fencing, and knife throwing and revolver practice but they had swimming and rowing squads and rifle ranges for rifle practice, and they had regular military training. The colonel who planned out the military training was a clever chap. The men were grouped in little squads of twenty, each with sergeant and corporal. Each of these twenty was trained to act like a scout independently, though the squad worked in absolute unison among themselves and were pledged to absolute obedience of higher commands. These commands, however, left most of the devising and method of execution of the job in hand to the squad itself. In New South Wales, the Maggies, as these private squads were called, numbered already about 1,400, all perfectly trained and equipped. They had a distinctive badge of their own, a white, broad-brimmed felt hat, like the ordinary cocky military hat, but white, and with a tuft of white feathers. Because, said Ennis, the colonel, we're the only ones that can afford to show the white feather. These Maggies, probably from magpies, because Colonel Ennis used to wear white riding breeches and black gaiters and a black jacket and a white stock, with his white hat, were the core and heart of the digger movement. But Kangaroo had slaved at the other half of the business, the mental side. He did want his men to grip on to the problem of the future of Australia. He had insisted on attendance at debates and discussions. Australia and the world, Australia and the future. White Australia, Australia and the Reds. Class feeling in Australia. Politics in Australia. Australians and work. What is democracy? What is an Australian? What do our politicians do for Australia? what our state parliament does for us, what our federal parliament does for us, what side of the Australian does parliament represent, is parliament necessary to democracy, what is wrong with Soviet rule, do we want a statesman or do we want a leader, what kind of leader do we want, what aim have we in view, are we Australians, are we democratic, do we believe in ourselves, so the debates had been going on for a year and a half now. These debates were for club members only, and each club numbered only 50 members. Every member was asked to take part in the debates, and a memorandum was kept of each meeting. Then there were monthly united gatherings of five or six or more clubs together, and occasionally a mass meeting at which Kangaroo spoke. All this went on in the open and roused some comment in the press at first a great deal of praise, later some suspicion and considerable antagonism, both from conservatives and labor. Ben Cooley was supposed to be working himself in as a future prime minister with a party behind him that would make him absolute, a dictator. As soon as one paper came out with this alarm, an opponent sneered and pooh-poohed and spoke of the Reds lounging about, a fearful menace, in Sydney, and recalled the reigns of terror in Paris and in Petrograd. Was another reign of terror preparing for Sydney? Was a bloodthirsty Robespierre or a ruthless Lenin awaiting his moment? Would responsible citizens be lynched in Martin Place and dauntless citizenesses thrown into the harbor when the fatal hour struck? Whereupon a loud burst from the press were we to be alarmed by the knock-kneed, loudest socialist gang that hung around Canberra House? These gentry could hardly kill the vermin in their own clothing, not to speak of lynching in Martin Place, 
whereas the Maggies were a set of efficient, well-armed, and no doubt unscrupulous tools of still more designing and unscrupulous masters. If we had to choose between Napoleon in the shape of Ben Cooley or Lenin in the lack of shape of Willie Struthers, we should be hard put to it to know which was worse. Whereupon a fierce blast about our returned heroes and the white-livered skulkers who had got themselves soft jobs as coast watchers, watching that the sharks didn't nibble the rocks, and now dared lift their dishonorable croaks against the revered name of Digger. And a ferocious Russian from labor, which didn't see much Napoleon in Ben Cooley, except a belly and the knack of filling his pockets. Napoleon, though by the dago and not a Jew, had filled one of the longest pockets Europe had ever emptied herself into, so where would poor little Australia be when the sham kangaroo, with the help of the magpies, which were indeed strictly butcher birds, started to coin her into shekels? Then the boom died down, but the digger clubs had grown immensely on the strength of it. There were now more than a hundred clubs in New South Wales, and nearly as many in Victoria. The chief in Victoria was a smart chap, a mining expert. They called him the emu to match kangaroo on the Australian coat of arms. He would be the Trotsky to the new Lenin, for he was a born handler of men. He had been a lieutenant colonel in the war, a very smart soldier, and there had been a great cry to keep him on for the defense force. But he had got the shove from government, so he cleared out and went back to his mining. But every club had its own committee, and this committee was composed of five or six of the best, surest members, sworn into secrecy and to absolute obedience to any decision. Each club committee handled every question of development, and the master and the teller went to section meetings. A section consisted of ten clubs. A decision at a section meeting was carried to the state meeting, where the chief of the state always had the ruling vote. Once a decision was passed, it became a law for all members, embodied in the person of the chief, and interpreted by him unquestioned save by his lieutenant, the chief of all the secretaries or tellers. The public members of the clubs were initiated into no secrets. The most important questions were discussed only among the chiefs. More general secrets were debated at the section meetings, that is, the great bulk of the members gave only their allegiance and their spirit of sympathy. The masters and chiefs carefully watched the response to all propositions at all open discussions. They carefully fostered the feelings that they wished for, or which they were instructed to encourage. When the right feeling was arrived at, presumably, then the secret member started the discussion of propositions proposed from above. A secret member was allowed to make a proposition also, and the list was read over at the section meetings. But the Jack, the chief of the tellers, had right of absolute veto. Summers could not get it very clear from Jack Colcott's description, but it seemed to him as if all the principal ideas originated with the chief went round the circuit of the clubs, disguised as general topics for debate, and returned as confirmed principles via the section meetings and the state meetings. All the debates had been a slow, deliberate crystallizing of a few dominant ideas in all the members. In the actual putting into practice of any principle, the chief was an autocrat, though he might, if he chose, send his propositions through the section meetings and the state meetings for criticism and amendment. What I feel, said Summers to Jack, is that the bulk of you just don't care what the chief does so long as he does something. Oh, we don't lose our sleep at nights. If he likes to be the boss, let him do the thinking. We know he's our man, and so we'll follow him. We can't all be Peter and Paul and know all about it. You just feel he's your man? Oh, we do. But supposing you go in and win, and he's the boss of Australia, shall you still leave things to him? Jack thought lazily for a time. I should think so, he replied with a queer, mistrustful tone. And Summers felt again so distinctly that they were doing it all just in order to have something to do, to put a spoke in the wheel of their present bosses, to make a change, just temporary. There would be a change, and that was what they wanted. There was all the time the excitement. Damn the consequences. You don't think it would be as well to have a Soviet and Willie Struthers? No, I don't, said Jack, in a thin, sharp voice. 
I don't want to be bullied by any damned red international labor. I don't want to be kissing and hugging a lot of foreign labor tripe, niggers and what the hell. I'd rather have the British Empire 10,000 times over, and that bed's a bit too wide and too many in it for me. I don't like sleeping with a lot of neighbors, but when it comes to going to bed with a crowd of niggers and dagos in an international labor combine with a pair of red sheets so that the dirt won't show, I'm absolutely sure I won't have it. That's why I like kangaroo. We shall be just cozy and Australian with a boss like a father who gets up first in the morning and locks up at night before you go to bed. And who will stop in the empire? Oh, I suppose so, but he won't be asking even the British to go to bed with him. He knows the difference between Australia and the rest of the empire. The empire's like a lot of lockup shops that you do your trade in. But I know Kangaroo well enough to know he's not mixing his family in. He'll keep Australia close and cozy. That's what I want, and that's what we all want when we're in our senses and aren't bitten into spots by the Red International bug. Summers then mentioned Jazz's proposition of a Red Revolution first. I know, said Jack. It may be so. He's one of your sly, crawling devils, Jazz is, and that seems to be the road nowadays. I wouldn't mind egging the Reds in and then slapping them clean out into nowhere. I wouldn't mind at all. But I'm bound to follow Kangaroo's orders, so I'm not bothering my chump over Jazz's boodle. You don't care which way it happens? Jack looked at him sideways, like the funny bird. No, he said, with an Australian drawl. So long as it does happen. I don't like things as they are, and I don't feel safe about them. I don't mean I want to feel safe as if nothing would ever happen. There's some sorts of sport and risk that you enjoy, and there's others you hate the thought of. Now I hate the thought of being bossed and messed about by the old country, or by Jew capitalists and bankers, or by a lot of labor bullies or a Soviet. There's no fun in that sort of sport to me, unless you can jolly well wipe the bleeders out afterwards. And I don't altogether want the mills of the British Empire to go grinding slowly on, and yourself compelled to do nothing but grind slowly with them. It's too much of a sameness altogether, and not as much sport as a tin lizzie. We're too much mixed up with other folks' business. What's absolutely no fun for us? No, what I want is a cozy, lively little Australia, away from all this blooming world boost. I've no use for a lot of people across a lot of miles of sea nudging me while I handle my knife and fork. Leave us Australians to ourselves. We shall manage. They were interrupted by Harriet calling for Summers to come and rescue the tea towel from the horns of a cow who had calmly scrambled through the fence onto their grass. Summers was used to the cow. She had scrambled through the cooey fence long before the Summers had ever walked through the gate so she looked on them as mild intruders. He was quite friendly with her. She ate the pumpkin rind and apple parings from his hand. Now she looked at him half guiltily out of one eye, the kitchen towel hanging over the other eye. She took it quite calmly, but had a disreputable appearance. Come here, said he. Come here and have it taken off. Of course you had to poke your head into the bush if you thought there was a towel on it. She came mildly up and held her head while he disentangled the towel from her horns. Then she went calmly on, snuffing at the short bitten grass for another mouthful, and twitching leaves off the stunted bushes. So they were, the cows, so unafraid. In Cornwall, Harriet said, the cows had always sniffed in when she came near, and then breathed out heavily, nuh, nuh, as if they did not like the smell of human beings, breathing out against her and backing and they had scared her. But these cows didn't do that. They seemed so calm. They fed over all the bush, the unoccupied grassy lots above the sea, among the unbuilt streets, and they pushed in among the trees and bushes where the creek came in. And then at dusk a boy would come on a cream-colored pony riding round and driving them in, scaring a sort of crane or heron bird from the still waters of the marshy creek edge. Then the cows walked or trotted placidly home, so unconcerned, and the bird with the great arched gray wings flapped in a low circle round, then settled again a yard or two from where she was before. So unconcerned. Summers had noticed a pair of fishing birds by the creek, queer objects nearly as big as ducks, 
perched at the extremity of a dead gum tree above the water. They flew away at his coming, but while he stood looking, they circled with their longish necks stretched out, and their wings sharply flicking in the high air. Then one returned and sat again on the tree, and the other perched on another dead tree. The near one looked sideways at him. "'Yes, I am here,' he said aloud. Whereupon she did the inevitable, turned her back on him, and he no longer existed for her. These ostriches needed no sand. She so far forgot him as to turn sideways to him again, so he had her in profile, clutched gray like an old knot at the tip of the stark, dead, gray tree. And there she performed queer corkscrew exercises with her neck in the air. Whether it was she getting down a last fishbone in her gizzard, or whether she was merely asserting herself in the upper air, he could not tell. What a fool you look, he said aloud to her. Then away the birds rose, and he saw a seedy elderly man in black, in a long-skirted black coat like a cast-off Methodist parson, spying at him furtively from behind the bushes on the other side of the creek. This parson-looking wee carried a gun and was shooting heaven knows what. He thought Richard Lovett a very suspicious bird, and Richard Lovett thought him the last word in human weeds. So our young man turned away to the sands, where the afternoon sea had gone a very dark blue. Another human weed with a very thin neck and a very red face sat on the sand ridge up which the foam edge swished, his feet wide apart, facing the ocean and tending a line which he had in some way managed to cast out into the low surf. An urchin, barefoot, was pottering round in silence like a sandpiper. The elderly one made unintelligible noises as Summers approached. The latter realized it meant he was not to catch with his foot the line which reached out behind the thin fisherman covered with sand. So he stepped over it. The brown barefoot urchin pottered round unheeding. He did not even look up when the elder made more unintelligible sounds to him. My father is a fisherman. Oh, a fisherman. Yes, a fisherman. He catches all the fish he can. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays were the library nights. When you had crossed the iron footbridge over the railway, you came to a big wooden building with a corrugated iron roof, standing forlorn at an unmade corner, like the fag end of the village. But the village was an agglomeration of fag ends. This building might have been a temporary chapel as you came at it from the back, but in front it was labeled Pictoria, so it was a cinema. But there was also a black board with gilt letters like a chapel notice board, which said School of Arts Library, and the Pictoria had a sort of little wing, all wood, like a little schoolroom. And in one section of this wing was a School of Arts Library, which the Summers had joined four rows of novels, the top now a hundred or more thin books, all nat gold or Zane Grey. The young women came for Zane Grey. Oh, the maid of Mudgy is a lovely thing, lovely. A young woman was pronouncing from the top of the broken chair which served as stool to give access to this top row. Yavin, got a new Zane Grey, have you? She spoke in these tones of unmitigated intimacy to the white-mustached librarian. One would have thought he was her dear old dad. Then came a young railway man who had heard there was a new Nat Gold. But, said Summers, as he and Harriet went off with a Mary E. Mann and a George A. Birmingham, I don't wonder they can't read English books or only want Nat Gold. All the scruples and the emotions and the regrets in English novels do seem a waste of time out here. I suppose, said Harriet, if you don't have any inside life of your own, it must seem a waste of time. But look at it. Look. The object she bade him look at was a bone of contention between them. She wanted to give five pounds to have four posts and an iron chain put round it, and perhaps a bit of grass sewed inside the enclosure. He declared that they'd probably charge ten pounds for the chain alone, since it was Australia, and let it alone. It was of a piece with the rest. But Harriet said she couldn't leave the place till she'd had something done to it. He said she was an interfering female. The object was a memorial to the fallen soldiers. It was really a quite attractive little monument, a statue in pale, fawnish stone, 
of a Tommy standing at ease with his gun down at his side wearing his putties and his turned up felt hat. The statue itself was about life size but standing just overhead on a tall pedestal it looked small and stiff and rather touching. The pedestal was in very nice proportion and had at eye level white inlet slabs between little columns of gray granite bearing the names of the fallen on one slab in small black letters and on the other slabs the names of all the men who served. God bless them. The fallen had lest we forget for a motto. Carved on the bottom step it said unveiled by Granny Rice, a real township monument bearing the names of everybody possible. The fallen, all those who donned cocky, the people who presented it, and Granny Rice, wonderfully in keeping with the place and its people, naive but quite attractive, with the stiff, pallid, delicate, fawn-colored soldiers standing forever stiff and pathetic. But there it stood a few yards from the corner of the corrugated Pictoria, at the corner of the fag end road to the station, like an old milk can someone had set down and forgotten, or a brand new milk can. Old rags of paper littered the ground at the base with an old tin or two. A little further back was a German machine gun, also looking as if it had been scrapped and forgotten. Standing there with its big metal screen flap, it looked exotic, a thing of some higher culture, demoniac and fallen. Harriet was dying to rescue the forlorn monument that seemed as if it had been left there in the bustle of removal. She wanted to enclose it, but he said, leave it, leave it, they don't like things enclosed. She still had in her mind's eye an Australia with beautiful manorial farmhouses and dainty perfect villages. She never acquiesced in the uncreatedness of the new country, the rawness, the slovenliness. It seemed to her comical, for instance, that no woman in Australia would carry a basket. Harriet went shopping as usual with her pretty straw basket in the village, but she felt that the women remarked on it. Only then did she notice that everybody carried a suitcase in this discreet country. The fat old woman who came to the door with a suitcase must, she thought, be a visitor coming to the wrong house. But no, did she want a cabbage? In the suitcase, two cabbages and half a pumpkin. A little girl goes to the dairy for six eggs and half a pound of butter with a small, elegant suitcase. Nay, a child of three, toddled with a little six-inch suitcase, containing, as Harriet had occasion to see, two buns because the suitcase flew open and the two buns rolled out. Australian suitcases were always flying open and discharging groceries or a skinned rabbit or three bottles of beer. One had the impression that everybody was perpetually going away for the weekend with a suitcase. Not so at all. Just a new country bit of convention. Ah, a new country. The cabbage, for example, cost ten pence in the normal course of things, and a cauliflower a shilling. And the tradesmen's carts flew round in the wilderness delivering goods. There isn't much newness in man, whatever the country. That old aeroplane that had lain broken down in a field, it was nowadays always staggering in the low air just above the surf, past the front of Kui, and lurching down onto the sands of the town beach. There, in the cold wind, a forlorn group of men and boys round the aeroplane, the sea washing near, the marsh of the creek desolate behind. Then a passenger mounted, and men shoving the great insect of a thing along the sand to get it started. It buzzed venomously into the air, looking very unsafe and wanting to fall in the sea. Yes, he's carrying passengers. Oh, quite a fair trade, thirty-five shillings a time. Yes, it seems a lot, but he has to make his money while he can. No, I've not been up myself, but my boy has. No, you see, there was four boys and they had a sweepstake eight and six apiece, and my boy won. He's just eleven. Yes, he liked it, but they was only up about four minutes. I timed them myself. Well, you know, it's hardly worth it. But he gets plenty to go. I heard he made over forty pound on Whit Monday, here on this beach. It seems to me, though, he favors some more than others. There's some he flies round with for ten minutes, and that last chap now, I'm sure he wasn't up a second more than three minutes. No, not quite fair. Yes, he's a man from Bully. Was a flying man all through the war. 
Now he's got this machine of his own. He's quite right to make something for himself if he can. No, I don't know that he has any license or anything. But a chap like that who went through the war, why, well, who's going to interfere with his doing the best for himself? End of chapter 10, Kangaroo, part 2. Recorded by Bryce, Youngstown, 1985-1986.